As part of her career studying scientists and how they learn, Stephanie Slater discovered that almost all scientists were inspired to enter the field for the same three reasons. Their emotional answer is the same exact as mine, right? And the three things. One, you watch Star Trek as a kid. If you're of a certain age, like I am about 50 years old, you watch Star Trek on reruns after school all the time, right? So I watch it every day on Channel 44 in Tampa, Florida, 3 o'clock. Um, second thing is that um, I watch Carl Sagan, Cosmos, PBS, right? And the third thing is that about when I, when I was about 10 years old, um, I got a telescope for Christmas. A little cheap kind you might get at Walmart or something like that. And I went outside and I looked at the moon and saw craters. And I looked at the Pleiades and I saw that blue reflection nebula. And then I looked at Jupiter. I saw the, all four moons, all four of the Galilean moons lined up. And with my 10 year old lack of knowledge of physics, all I could think was, oh my gosh, it's a sign. They've lined up for me. Dr. Slater started as a planetary sciences major at MIT, switched to biology, and then taught high school for 15 years. What I really wanted to understand was how my students think about things. So that's what I went back and got my PhD in. And I decided that I was going to study a real specialized group of scientists, the astronomers. What has surprised me most is that the human brain and the way it learns things changes surprisingly little from the time that you're really little to the time that you're very old. We have this idea that um, the brain of a five-year-old and the brain of a, a 20-year-old are very different things. Those really early years are so formative in what your brain's capable of doing, the, the filters that your brain puts on. It, it's almost like you get stuck that way, right? And the, the great thing about that is that we could teach much more complicated things to little kids. Like, I've taught multi-wavelength astronomy to kindergartners before, and they totally get it. Um, and other things that your brain would struggle with when you're five, like why we have seasons, I would still struggle, struggle to teach you when you're 50, right? Your brain doesn't change as much as you think it does, and that's an odd thing. As she studied how we learn and what we learn, Dr. Slater looked towards the Pacific Ocean. One of the things that I was interested in in, in my cognitive science work is uh, people's spatial reasoning abilities. And so I started trying to look into groups, uh, like occupational groups, that are really great spatial reasoners. And I kept coming back to the Polynesian navigators, the wayfinders that can take uh, a small canoe and travel thousands of miles without a compass or a computer or a cell phone or anything. How do they do that? It's amazing. So um, when I started uh, working out in Hawaii, I got to know that group of people. I got to know the wayfinders a little bit better and start to try to map how it is they conceive of the sky which is very different. So in, in, in Western culture, we have 88 constellations, right? And they're all pretty small. In the Hawaiian uh, navigation, we have four constellations. And each one of the constellations goes all the way from the south. One constellation stretches from the South Pole all the way up to the North Pole. So you memorize, the wayfinder memorizes the whole sky as a chunk, which allows them to not have to think as hard. It's easier to find stars, that kind of thing. So, um, so they started to ask us to go on cruise ships and talk about how wayfinding is done and what Hawaiian navigational astronomy looks like. And it's, it's been an extraordinary experience because it's, it's one thing being in a planetarium and saying, hey, if I know these two stars, I know exactly where south is, or I know exactly what's due east, exactly what's due west. It's one thing sort of uh, saying that in a, an academic kind of sense, and it's another thing being on the boat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and pointing to the stars and saying another star is about to pop out of this, this cloud right here and south is right there. Um, it's just a really powerful, cool feeling and really fun to share with people. Dr. Slater is a regular at the Shore Leave Science Fiction Convention and this year she gave a talk on tsunamis. As a resident of Hawaii, it's an important subject to her. So this is a very real thing for us, um, you know, especially this past year, we've experienced potentially tsunami creating earthquakes on a fairly regular basis on our island. Um, so you do have to be aware of these things, but when we give these talks at science fiction conventions about tsunamis or eclipses or um, weather on Mars, it's really to use sci-fi as a vehicle to get people's interests to talk about the real science behind it. If your love of science fiction encourages you to get involved in science, Baltimore County Public Library can help you with titles like 
technology. The science of Star Trek from tricorders to warp drive. The real story, close encounters of the third kind. How we'll live on Mars. Space stations, the art, science, and reality of working in space. Or if you just want to get inspired, try the Academy series by Jack McDevitt. The Martian movie and the novel it was based on. And the classic Star Trek, the original series. I've watched all of the original episodes multiple times, taking detailed notes on the science that's in those episodes. And the truth is there's almost no science in Star Trek, the original series, and no astronomy. And what attempts there are at astronomy are really bad attempts at astronomy. And it doesn't matter because um, the reason we go into science after watching Star Trek is because it causes us to dream of being part of something really big.